Hello and welcome to another special edition of the Roker Report podcast. We are at the Academy of Life today with two gentlemen who I'm sure you already know, but I'll introduce them nonetheless. So, Sunderland manager Jack Ross. Go on, how are you? Okay. Um, can't complain. Good. Take it over nicely. And James Fowler, how are you? I'm good too. Okay. Take it over very nicely. Um, we've got loads to talk about today. Uh, we've got an hour, a strict hour, because usually we've got tactics to talk. So. Corners to sort, Connor. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll start. You, you can't ask that question later on, though. Start, yeah, because it's been done. Yeah. <laughs> we'll start a bit though about your personal life. Obviously, you've moved up to the northeast. So how are you finding the area? Good. Um, I think that and James will agree, and it's not. It's not just us two. John Potter, they came down as a first team coach as well. So we all we all came here, lock, stock, and barrel, if you like. So we moved. Wife's moved down. Children moved down. Started schools, nurseries. Um, and I think that, I know people might not think that's important, but for us it was, um, I think, a sense of our commitment to the job, but also we were backing ourselves, if you like, because we were coming to a club that had turned over a lot of managers in recent times, and to move, not just in our industry, in any industry, to move your family is a big decision and a big commitment, so we've all we've all moved to the North East, um, a little bit spread out, John and James stay closer to each other than, than I stay at them, but we're... Um, I've enjoyed it. I mean, certainly from my point of view, my wife and and two daughters have have, have settled brilliantly. You know, we've we've what, been down eight months now, and yeah, really enjoyed it. Really enjoyed it. And you both lived in Sunderland. No, I'm uh, kind of within five minutes of training ground as well. So uh, when we first moved down, Leanne Bennett had kind of recommended some uh, areas round about. It was close by. I was looking to stay relatively close. Uh, so as I say, I'm quite born, so I'm really really close. Kids go to to Cleden. As well, so they they love the school there, and it's it's a lovely, a lovely part of the world. It's interesting to know how you two know each other because you didn't play together. So when did you first, you know, see each other and then know that you'd be a good working partnership? I think to begin with, we're actually we were born not far from each other. So I'm Falkirk, Fow Sterling. So and then I was brought up in Falkirk, Fow Bannockburn. So they're not that far apart. Um, however. Didn't really know each other. James is a bit younger than me, but played against each other a lot through our career, and then um, managed against each other. I mean, James was manager of the Queens, and I was manager of Alloa. Um, and then James, when he left Queens, had came over to Alloa a few times because it was quite local to him as well. Um, when I was taking training, etc., and start got to know each other a bit better, and then just like sometimes in life, the timing, the opportunity came up for me to go to St. Martin and. Um, I had the opportunity to take somebody in with me to work alongside me and the conversations that we'd had. There'd probably been a mutual respect through our playing careers and then the conversations we'd had post-playing, we felt it was worth giving it a go, if you like, <coughs> and it's, um, you know, it's been good because we've obviously spent a lot of time with each other in that, in that time since. What's the transition from being a number one to a number two, James? Uh, oh, obviously, my last game as a number one was uh, against Alloa, uh, <laughs> against the Gaffer, so I, I left Queen's after that. Uh, that game, uh, and as I say, we went over. I heard a lot of good things about the manager, so I was I was keen to go over and chat to him. Uh, and speaking about my next move in, in football was was potentially going as a, an assistant manager or or becoming a coach, either at first team or maybe like under twenties in Scotland or twenty threes down here. Uh, so I think obviously when the manager got the opportunity, uh, that was probably still in his mind, uh, and obviously I'm grateful for that uh, that chance that, I, that I've been given, uh, and it's been uh, a great kind of. Two two and a half years, I think we've worked together and had a lot of a lot of highs and not many lows. So uh, hopefully that continues. And what do you do away from football? So you get home on a Friday at ten o'clock or whatever time you finish. Mm. What do you do? What do you do to relax? Um, well, I think I think a lot of managers will tell you and people involved in the coaching side of the game that, that you can probably be as busy or as quiet as you want to be. We're quite relentless in the work we do. Um, I'm not the easiest person to work for sometimes in that respect because I probably put a lot of demands on myself and a lot of demands on my staff. So the bulk of our time is eating up with work, whether it be in here or even away from here. Um, but I do think you also have to have that balance correct in terms of when you are home. So I've got two daughters, James has got two daughters. So that, I'm sure James would agree, takes up the bulk of any time we have away from here. I managed to squeeze in an hour a week at CrossFit now that's my one hour at least the one hour I don't take the phone out the car and into the building with me um, and I enjoy it because for, for that probably solitary hour of the week if you like I don't think about work apart from that even when I'm 
I'm at home, and my wife would agree, and I'm sure James would be the same, that it's very difficult to, to escape from the job. James or GG? Yeah, it's, it's difficult to switch off. You're always kind of either on a computer or, or on phone, whether it's texting back and forth as well, especially at night. The days off, I usually try and leave the gaffer to, to himself, so I used to give him a bit of uh, time with the family. Uh, sometimes when I get in, it's, it's homework, it's reading with the kids. Uh, in the summer, it was nice to actually walk along Seaburn Beach and stuff as well. It was, it was nice, uh, the kids loved that, going to the park. And then usually on a Sunday for off, then they do horse riding, so that's something that I get to to get along to and, and see them doing that. But yeah, it's usually kind of football non-stop, and you're fitting the family in round about that, which is just one of the yeah, parts of the job as well. Dead, dead exciting couple of guys, eh? yeah. I bet, you're, I, bet you're, I bet you're absolutely delighted you got us on. <laughs> what do you think in the future with football managers? Do you think we'll still see managers do 30, 40 years after they've finished? Or do you think the job's too taxing now to do that? I mean, could you see yourself um, as a manager in 15 years? I hope so, but it's a good, it is a good question, and I think it's a relevant question, because the game, not only I think the demand's off, I think the, I think the turnover of managers is, um, is remarkable. Now, I did a presentation yesterday at a business lunch, and the opening slide was 30 out of 92, because I think that's what's went in England so far. Only one voluntary. Only one voluntarily, yeah. And I think in Scotland at the moment, I think it's 16 out of 42, so there's... You know that's incredible, and it's probably not entirely appropriate in some of the cases. Um, so the longevity, or, or having the longevity career in football managers, I think is becoming even more challenging. Um, I suppose the, the role I think has become more encompassing. I think there's so many different factors. I think there's so much involved, and and I've certainly seen it now coming to a big club. You know, there's a lot of demands on my time, and it is it is intense. Um, but on the flip side, if you've got a passion and a love for it, then you want to keep doing it. So um, I would like to hope that I'm still doing it um, because I genuinely love managing. And you know, James has probably touched on that earlier, but that a little bit different between coaching and managing. I think he genuinely loves coaching. So that helps you if you like cope with the, the intensity of the job. So talk about manager turnover. How difficult is it to plan long term when you do know that the average Duration is about 18 months for a, a football league manager. I mean, do you have to think long term or do you think more, you know, the next six months, the next six games? Is that how you have to take it as a manager? It's a fine balance to walk. I mean, I know that um, quite often when you go on any sort of courses or if you're doing any of your licenses as an aspiring coach or manager, then um, people ask you for short term, mid term, long term plans. The reality is, you know, for you to have any sort of long term plan, if, to give to football clubs and managers, you're probably not going to fulfil that. And also, then you have to think you have to be careful um, what you try and enforce upon a club, if you like. So, but by that I mean that James and I were over in Valencia last summer um, to watch them train and see their setup, etc. And they they have a really interesting philosophy that they they bring or they, they try and create players just to play professional football in Spain. So they don't necessarily bring through players to play for Valencia's first team. Because they made the point, that I think they've had X amount of head coaches in a short period of time. So if I was to come into Sunderland and say, "Well, I want every team in the academy to play this way," that's rubbish. Because really, I can maybe make some pointers about some fundamentals of how we play. But the reality is, by the time an eleven-year-old gets to first-team level, it might be slim chance that I'll still be the manager. So it's a um, we. You have to be short term in terms of trying to get through the next game, the next challenge that lies ahead. But hopefully, Stuart, as an owner, I think has been appreciative for the approach we've taken to the being fairly pragmatic and trying to take this club forward at a, an appropriate pace, if you like, and one that can satisfy the demands of the fan base, but also be relative to where the club's found itself in recent times and make sure that we never find ourselves in that position again. Can you talk us through what the first team coach and staff structure is? Because I don't think fans necessarily know, you know, about you know sports psychologists. Whether or not you have an analytical team who you know look in depth at stats. I mean, how big is the coach? Yeah, staff? I mean, I, I suppose I could give you an overview of it, and James could maybe give you a greater insight into those individual roles, particularly his and some of the staff close to him. So we, there's a lot of things happened in the summer here that we might touch on later, and people will never get to see and maybe realise the huge state of transition this club was in. So even in, in terms of the staff that I inherited, it took me probably a couple of weeks before, I, from being in the door till I actually was given a breakdown of the staff and what we had. And the reality was we were carrying a premiership staffing structure 
when the club was now found itself in League One. So that was always going to change for very obvious reasons. But then we had to fill the holes and try and you know make a staff that still could carry what we wanted to do. And so we were fortunate that we also inherited some good people here. That gets often lost in the the takeover and new people coming in. There's some good people at this club, really good people, um, and a lot of them remain with us on the football staff. And so on the football staff at the moment, see myself and James, John Potter, first team coach, Craig Sampson, goalkeeping coach. So we then have head physio Peter Brand, who's been at the club for a number of years. Um, Craig Russell, obviously head masseur, and then Paul Walsh, who's now doing the job of probably what three people were doing previously in terms of overseeing the whole sports science department. Um, Mark Body, who's been here for a number of years as well, uh, in the analysis department, and we brought Ewan Fallingham from St Mon with us, a young analyst as well, so th those two cover that. So, um, although that staff still sounds, um, I don't think I missed the end, they still, Chris Nisby, Chris Nisby as well helps Peter in the, the medical side, sounds still quite healthy, it, it's probably more akin to a lot of other clubs, it's certainly nowhere near at the levels it was at before. No, and obviously just on our staff, myself, John Potter, uh, Craig Sampson, all share an office. So obviously Craig does the goalie stuff. Myself and John have got probably similar type roles. I probably do a little bit more paperwork, a little bit more media duties if the gaffer's uh, time demands uh, mean that I need to help him out with that. Uh, do some more paperwork type thing as well, that rather than John uh, doing that, uh, and then obviously. With the gaffer, as I said, being so busy, we probably try and keep that backroom staff together as well in terms of getting charts on a regular basis and, and feeding little bits and pieces back to the manager that maybe aren't that important, but he does want to know about them as well. So uh, I think myself and John will do that uh, and, as I say, support the manager in, in anything that, that he sees fit. Uh, saying there can be all different types of challenges within a working week. I want to talk a little bit about the atmosphere. Um, there's been an initiative set up by the Red and White Army fan group mm. and they want to create flags and banners to go on the new road ground. And I saw that you you two both donated to the St Mirren mm. equivalent yeah. when you were there. Is that something that you think is really important to have that sort of you know identity in the stadium where we can see what Sunderland is behind that goal, which is the home end? I think it's hugely important. I think it's became... Um, I think that the clubs that have got it right within their stadiums, within their fan base, I think you've seen the benefits from it. Um, I, I think you've got to remember, and again, I might go back to this as the conversation goes on, and I'm, I, I'm always keen to point this out within conversations that we're football fans. You know, we just happen to have made a living from it as players and then as coaches and managers. But and I know this because of the relationship James and I have got. We both genuinely love football, so that love for football. Even if you know I've been rejected as a player, for rejections as a player, James has lost his job as a manager, it just doesn't dilute your love for the game. So all these things I get, and so when we were at Simon, the um, there was a fans group that created a singing section within the stadium, and they, things were going well on the pitch as well, which helped. But the two came together at the right time, and probably I thought the club could have been a little bit more supportive. Some of the, some parts of the club. And we just felt that what they gave us as a team, both at home and away, was fantastic in any way we could help them. And I've had conversations with the support liaison officer here that I would be equally supportive of anything. It's on a far grander scale. Um, but clubs that have got it right, it can make a huge difference to the same. And what I also think it does is that some of the fans don't struggle for a sense of identity with the football club. I mean that with the fan base, because that fan base is very obvious and huge and, and very loyal and committed. But by creating a group like that as well, as you, you increase that identity and being part of something, and that matters to a lot of people as well, because that gives them something that they can belong to, if you like, on a on a weekly or a bi-weekly basis. And the group was a young, a young lad in Scotland called Josh McGuinness that did it as a mum. And, it was remarkable what he created, you know, really good. And I think that if it can be replicated, then we can be supportive for that as a management team. And, and I've always maintained that that support will be consistent, irrespective of whether we're getting plaudits or criticism. Because, you know, I think you have to be conscious of that as well. I've got to be co consistent in my support of that. You know, all of a sudden, because some people boo me or think I don't know what I'm doing, then my opinion of that being important in the game is going to remain. You know, it's still going to be there. I want to talk a little bit about the scouting network we've got here. So, 
how, how does that work from your end? Do you give instructions or do you leave that to Tony Corton or is it just a joint group effort? No, I think we, um, so that again, going back to the summer, there was a lot of change at the club and a lot of things that are still very much a work in progress. Um, and obviously this year as well, we had the, the added complication of Tony's, um, Tony had a health issue, obviously quite a big health issue and you know, thankfully he's recovered well from that and he's, he's back to you know approaching full health. Um, but that area still needs strengthened. We still need more resources to help Tony strengthen that. Um, and then there's obviously many different facets to that. There's where you're looking to recruit from, so where you need people to watch games. And then the immediate importance for us is the is the opposition scouting. And that's where, again, James has said that about areas that he helps me with. So that liaison with those people that watch the games for us and collating the information falls more upon James and John to make sure that's covered along with Tony um, and it means then that our analysis department are getting the information they need so it's um, it's still a work in progress I'll be perfectly honest with you there's no point in this um, in pretending it's something that it's not it's something that needs to still improve Tony's done a fantastic job in terms of being thrown in to a really difficult situation as well but he is um, and I think Stuart's recognising that that we need to, to strengthen the resources that are available within that area of the club as well James, I want to ask you what a, a scout report then looks like. Because, I mean, fans mm. will have an idea of football manager. I don't know if that's accurate or not. But what do you provide to say, right, this is what we need to do? I mean, how, how do you do that and what does it look like? Uh, some it's pretty straightforward, some more complex. Obviously, you're getting formation for both teams. Uh, you're getting, obviously, the, the changes within that game, whether it's substitutions or, or, or change of shape. Uh, you're getting an opinion from the person watching that game. Uh, strengths and weaknesses and then how we can then influence what we do uh, onto the opposition as well and how we go on and win the game. Uh, and that's obviously a small part of it. Like the gaffer spoke about with the two analysts that we've had as well, they'll, they'll watch a number of games before we play someone and you're just looking for uh, small bits of information that you think are going to make, make the difference as well. Uh, and, and I think the manager's a big one for, for thinking or, or looking at what we do as well and how we uh, affect opposition and, and not worrying too much uh, about them, although we do obviously consider what they're they're going to bring to the game. Uh, but I think if we do uh, what we can do well, uh, then they will we'll win most games in this league. Is it like a dossier or like a PowerPoint or? No, I mean I think we, I think what's happened nowadays as well is because of the um, availability of footage has made a big difference. So now via a platform like Y Scout, um, there's an agreement if you you know if you're a club and you're partaking in that which almost every club does I think, um, then you have to upload your your footage um, by a certain time and you have to upload wide angle footage which is obviously the one that you want as a manager or as a coach. So scouting reports now are probably just lend support to what you can already see. So the pro in days gone by there would have been much more onus on the information you would have got sent via somebody at the game. James has touched on it, you're only looking from that as little bits of, there might be little nuggets within that. Because the reality is our analysts now will spend, you know, time watching the previous anywhere between four and six games, using the scouting report to then see what are they seen, does that marry up with the scouting report? And then it generally will come to us in say sometimes around about fifteen minute segments or fifty a kind of fifteen minute block, which I then will trim down to Maximum 10, 11 minutes to show the players. Um, that's kind of strength and weakness stuff. We'll do then different stuff in set of pieces. But, so there's a lot of work that goes in to get to 10 minutes of footage, if you like. It's a bit like making a television programme mm -hmm. or producing a podcast. Whatever it is, you know, there's a lot of sometimes content that goes into then producing what people will think of 10, 11 minutes. But there's a heck of a lot of um, man hours went into getting to that point. I think even just for your point of view, if, if we watch a team's previous three, four, five, six games, I think when they come to play Sunderland home or away, it's a different game for them. I think obviously we are the, the biggest team in this league. It's a cup final type game for, for most teams as well. So I think that's a challenge. Not looking too much previously at what they've done. It's how we can affect uh, what we do against them. And as I say, in, in dealing with so the, the atmosphere for, for teams coming. I know at the weekend when we had a game, seeing some of the opposition players coming out into the stadium and using their camera phones to video uh, the ground itself and you're thinking right and, and that's got a big field game for them and they're let's say we previously in Scotland played against Celtic Rangers and we knew that we had to be at it 
to have any chance of getting anything out of the game. And I say I think coming up against most teams uh, in the league this season, that's kind of been the feel of the game. I want to talk a little bit about transfers. So obviously the big one was Will Grigg. Um, and Stuart said on the podcast that you were happy with our business without Will Grigg. So how much happier are you now that he's he's through the door and signed? Oh yes, it's very obvious answers in my eyes. I have to say that when you eventually recruit the player that was the one you identified as your first choice or your number one target, um, the process of getting there <laughs> was was perhaps not as as smooth as we would have liked. Um, I know I, I listened to to part of your most recent podcast with you, and um, I, I mean he says I was a lot more relaxed than him. It's because recruitment's important, and it's is a a very, very, very important part of football management. But we can't then forget about the art of coaching or management. So the reality is whenever a window closes, the squad that you have at disposal, so when the summer window closed and because of injuries, etc., we had Josh Madger was the only recognised striker in our squad. So we had two choices then as a staff, as a manager and as a staff to be do we moan about it and complain about it or do we make the best of what we've got? And I think we did that. So Yes, it's much better than we've recruited Will. If the window shut and we hadn't, what would I have sat here and said? Would I have complained about it? No, I would have then said, how do I get the best from what we've got? How do we as a staff work out the best to, you know, best system, best formation, best personnel? What do we do in training that gets the best from them? How can we improve them? So you can't overlook that as well. And that's why I, maybe relax is the wrong word, but I've always felt as if that's part of our job. You know, part of your job is to make players better. Like we take great pride in that. We might not always get it right, but we take pride in kind of, if you like, what drives us on a daily basis to say, can we keep making those players better? Now that doesn't mean necessarily just need to be a young one. It can be, can I make, can we make Grant Ledbetter any better? Now we might not because he's he's a good player, a top player, but can we do anything that might improve him? If we can, then great. And if we have done, then we'd be, we've done our jobs properly. So what do you think about roles at a football club then? Because obviously, do you see yourself more as a head coach than a manager, or do you think well, the names are always <coughs> sort of? Irrelevant, just whatever they are, they are. No, I mean I've worked at I've worked at clubs where I've had a director of football and a head coach, um, and obviously there's more of that in the game. No, I think if you see my work on a daily basis, well, one, I'm pretty obsessed with coaching still, um, and I, you know I'm on the training pitch the vast majority of the time, the design of the sessions, etc. But I take on a lot of responsibilities that out with just being a coach. Um, I'm interested in the whole running of the club and involvement how we keep driving the club forward so I, I would hope to think that Stuart would agree that I do both um, but certainly there's probably people out there that would feel more comfortable than either one of them the truth is I quite enjoy both sides of it um, it can pull you, it can, you know, pull you quite far apart at times when you try to do them but I still enjoy both aspects of that job How was the transfer deadline day compared to anything you'd experienced before when you were here on the final day was it different? Uh, yeah, well, do you know what, we did our first window together at um, St Mum, we were bottom of the Scottish Championship with four points, something like that, or, I don't mind, a little bit more than that, but anyway we were cut adrift and and um, we basically, because it was just us doing everything um, and then an analyst that we brought down from Scotland, Ewan, um, we, we had a whiteboard in one of the coaches room full of names and we just worked through them yeah. and just us doing it um, so to say this was the most stressful one we probably forget what that one was like because that was really rolling the dice for us as well because we were in major trouble and we, we did 10 in 10 out that window and it was very much a one in one out basis as well um, this one was a little, I suppose a little bit different um, and it was a little bit Probably the bit we didn't enjoy was that lack of the kind of planning, etc. Because it went, you know, it became a bit manic that last few little bit, and that was probably a little bit different to how we work. But you know, I'd say this is probably the best way to describe it. So all, all's well that ends well is probably the best way to describe it. Uh, Lewis Morgan, obviously reunited with him, and he, I think, impressed everyone with his trickery and directness. But how important is it to have a winger like him that's different to say a McGeady or a Chris Maguire, somebody who's very direct and yeah, I think it's as I say, we always analyse the squad, analyse the games as well, and we've maybe been lacking a little bit of pace in that final third as well. And you see the directness of, of Lewis and Press on Saturday. So somebody we knew really well, we knew what he could bring and what he could add to the squad. And although he's a, a wide one uh, as well, 
that's that we've already got within the club. We know he's maybe slightly different to what we've got, and it gives us gives us a different option. Uh, and he can play as a ten and potentially play through the middle as well when he did uh, that in his, his younger career as well. So it's important that we added different types probably, and, and say physicality was one that we were lacking. We managed to bring in Jimmy Dunn earlier in the window as well. So we've probably not had a defensive midfielder as such and I think Grant Grant Ledbetter just fits that bill perfectly uh, to go alongside his, his love for this club as well. I think it was a great a great one to get in. Uh, so that's obviously helped in the other ones that we've brought in will add uh, different strengths to what we've already got as well. We've got a big game against Bristol Rovers coming up in the Checker Trade Trophy. Is that competition now a priority with being one game from Wembley? I think the competition has um I do believe it's one that was treated properly from early. Um, what we did was every single game we had in the competition, be it group stage or knockout, we picked a team that reflected the other challenges we had around that league matches and where we were with the squad. So even if you look at the Morecambe game, the last one, I know we were pretty much guaranteed to qualify. We played a really, really young team that night. But the circumstances dictated that. Um, so the good thing is there's been so many, I mean I don't know, if, but there's been so many players involved in that comp- in that competition this season. If you look through the squad there's been a lot, there's very few players that haven't played in it. Um, so that's been good because I think we've never really, it's never been if you like what could be seen as a reserve team playing in that competition. Mm-hmm. It's always been the strongest that we've had available, um, which I think has helped us then as we progress through the tournament and never all of a sudden go from being irrelevant to really important. I don't think. I mean, I certainly don't think from the squad they would have thought, "Oh well, nobody was really bothering about this." The manager is taking the approach; it doesn't matter because we've treated every game properly, which has meant by the time we've got to this stage, I don't think we need to flick a switch to say, "Oh, by the way, you're one game from Wembley," because we've always spoken about that. We've spoken about it in very early stages of the tournament. That, irrespective of what you think of this competition, the prize at the end of it is huge. And I genuinely, I'm pleased we've done that because we've we now I think we go into that game when it comes around in a frame of mind that the players don't. It's not going from not to sixty if you like. They're there. They're in that that they know that. Yeah. Well, obviously, we've had to win a lot of games to get to this stage. I mean, that's a big thing as well. You don't want to do all that hard work and get to this stage and not and not get to that final and go and win it. Well, I talk now about tactics. Um, obviously, we've strengthened very well in January, but does that pose a problem for you? And you know, you've got so many players now. How do you keep everyone happy? I think there's two, there's two sides to that. Um, one, I've always been reluctant to have too too fat a squad for want of a better description because I think it, um, not not that I worry about the problems because I think oh, hopefully each one of my every one of my players would tell you that they come in can come in my door in my office any time and speak to me if they're unhappy happy indifferent whatever it might be. It just in order to get the best out on the training pitch you need to probably keep it to certain numbers and we're right on the cusp of that and we're okay but we're right on the cusp of it um, but on the plus side of that what it's allowed us to do is is probably for the because f- we've had a lot of injuries this season a lot of injuries at different times and a lot of players unavailable for different reasons and over the last week to 10 days we've probably been the healthiest we've been allied to the new players coming in and it's allowed us to really push and push and push and players are not daft the players that are in there now know that do you know what I need to be at it if I'm not at it if I'm not at it in training I might not be in the squad if I'm not at it in games I might not stay in the team and that's I know it's very simplistic and it's pretty stereotypical to say it but that that's where you want to get to and I think we've I think we've got there and then in terms of managing the squad I said I think I have my communication is good with my players but equally that's where James and John's roles are probably a little bit different than mine and so vitally important because the the contact time with the players that they have is arguably more than me and the conversations they have with the players are generally on a more relaxed and yeah. informal basis as well. You know, they can you know, they can help to get players over a period where they have disappointment or frustration that they're, they're not in the team. Yeah, I think that's probably when I was playing as well, your best assistant manager or coaches were ones that you could, could speak to and, and you knew you could be honest and you didn't think that everything that you said was going to go back to the manager necessarily. Because you've got to have that trust as well yeah. that you think, right, yeah, they can they can have a little moan, they can have a bite, and then you can say, right, well, you just need to get your head down, work hard, uh, and make sure that you're you're at it every day, and, and things can change quickly. So I think we're, we're probably good at that. So Potts is a bit of a character as well, which which helps lighten the mood uh, at times when it's needed. Uh, so as I say, I think we've got good competition. We've seen that probably this week in training as well, that we feel it's maybe up a, 
up a notch as well because people know if they're not at it, then they say they might not even make the bench, so they might just start not holding. We played three at the back. Uh, Coventry, I think we played it for about three minutes and got an injury. Is that something though we could go back to? Is that something you would revisit? I've never been rigid in my approach to the game. I think we've changed the times working with me as well. I've, I've never been rigid in either my tactical setup or the approach in terms of how you do it. I, I, um, I think that I've always been prepared to be flexible, so I would never discount playing in any way. We we spend a We'll be, I'm not ever saying what we do is, is the best or better than anybody else. There's a lot of good coaches and managers out there. But the one thing I would always hold us up against others with is the intensity of our work and the relentlessness of our work and how much self-examination we do and how much we self-analyse our roles and everything and what we're doing, how we prepare the team. And I think that feeds through my players because they know that, you know, I'll sometimes put it in too much detail, an example of, um, of this week whereby we... Um, I, I made a couple of comments at half time on Saturday about things I thought we could do better within the game and then having watched the game back a couple of times I probably got one of them wrong you know what I was being critical of at half time we were actually doing okay in the first half so I can then relay that to the players in the meeting we had this morning the analysis meeting we had today so the flexibility I think we've shown flexibility within system this year I think we're going to have to show it again you know because we're looking at how do we how do we get better for these remaining months of the season? How do we make sure that we're maximising what we have available to us? And that's been an ongoing challenge for us. But the good thing is, I think, hopefully we're open-minded enough to take, to take that on. We've only conceded 13 goals from open play this season. So why are we so good? You know, it, you know the basic game of football without set pieces, which we'll talk about in a minute. Mm. But what makes us so good from open play? Well, I think there's probably two parts to that in that I think that we um, so we have uh, we have had a vulnerability from set pieces because we lack. There's no doubt we're one of the less physical teams in the league, but then that allows us to play in a certain way at times going the other way. Um, I think to the players' credit, I, I do think they're understanding of the shape and how they recover in the shape. We do a lot on it, and we also make a lot of demands on them in their discipline and how they recover. And I think that we haven't been caught open that many times this season. Um, and that's the players' credit. But then, you know, this, the, what I'm touching on there saying about the players' credit is ultimately uh, they're the ones that do it on a match day. Whatever we work on and we ask them to do, they're the ones that always deserve praise for when we do things properly because they're the guys that do the hardest part. They're the ones that are on the pitch. And I think within games as well, we, we probably dominate the ball quite a lot. I think we'll find, especially at home, teams will come and sit in. So even when they're winning the ball back, they're winning it back potentially in their own half or, or their, their own defensive third. It's a long way for them to go uh, and, and score from there, and obviously we can drop back into shape as the gaffer says and recover the ball. So uh, I think that that's got obviously a big part to play, uh, and probably hopefully conceding uh, as less goals as possible as well. So we're talking about set pieces, but defensively and offensively, we've struggled. It's fair to say in that department. What can we do to improve that? You've touched on not being physical enough, but mm. these are the players we've got now, so you're not going to be able to bring anyone in. How do we? improve that? Is it communication? Is it something else? Defensively, especially early in the season we found that as well and, and that was maybe a new challenge for us. It was partly the personnel that we had, it was the set up possibly that we, that we would look at as well. I think as the season progressed we've obviously worked on it quite a lot as well uh, on the training pitch uh, and it's obviously then sometimes passing on responsibility to players to organise because things change within games that you can't always account for and, and it needs that leadership uh, within the group as well to take control so I think we've progressed really got better as the, as the season's went on yeah I mean statistically we have a lot better as the season's went on in terms of how we've defended set pieces um, the, and then the flip side of it I mean the offensive set pieces has been uh, it's an ongoing source of frustration for us as a whole management team um, and it you know it's, I suppose there's a lot of parts of our job that people don't see um, and again, touching the presentation of the yesterday, there's also we do a job that there's a lot of people out there think they can do better than us, and that, that I don't have an issue with that. It just goes with the territory. Um, so there's two sides to that. We spend a lot of time looking at how we can improve upon all areas, um, and the frustration that's felt by that is was acute with us because we pride ourselves on being quite thorough. Um, and so, how do you improve it? Well what we are doing is been continuing to be relentless in our approach to it 
and then continually thinking what else can we do that just make sure we are, from our point of view, from a management and coaching point of view, making sure we're covering every single base. And then there's obviously things that happen on the pitch, so the consistent delivery's got to be, the quality delivery's got to be good, the movements have got to be as they've been asked to do and as they've been rehearsed and as they've been implemented in the training pitch. So there's a lot of things that have to come together. Um, now, you can have periods where it doesn't go for you in that respect, but undoubtedly we're, we're looking at it as saying, well, we, we've, you've got two choices. You can either, again, it's a bit like talking about the recruitment, you feel sorry for yourself and you can go, oh, well, we can't do any more. What more you know, throw your arms up in the air and say, what more can we do? Not the reality is we can always try and do more as, as coaches and managers um, in the hope that, not in the hope, in your increasing the chances of then maximising those opportunities because there's no doubt that we get a lot of set pieces because we spend a lot of time in the opposition half um, and it can be that that can be sometimes the fine margin between us drawing games and winning games so you know something that we continue to strive towards um, and we would always back ourselves to get it right I think it's, just, it's just making sure we keep doing as much as we can to get it right yeah and I think when we practised last week it was probably the best deliveries that we'd had so you're thinking good going into the weekend's game and then just as I say when the game happens uh, there's obviously factors within that that then kind of take over uh, and obviously the lack of physicality possibly as well that we're, we might actually be trying to be too specific of who we're trying to hit uh, as well rather than just being pretty general and saying right we'll miss that first man because I know that's a, a bugbear of the 30, 40,000 fans that are there plus the coaching staff and for the players as well because they're frustrated they're thinking right it's an opportunity for us to score uh, and is it something that we are working on we are conscious of as well and, uh, and hopefully get better and I think the psychology of it is important as well because uh, you know touching upon early in the season there was no doubt that, I mean our record early in the season conceding from open play was remarkable and yet you know our con conceding from set pieces wasn't great and we have improved that but that was a, a psychology to that as well because you had to make sure then players didn't become apprehensive about defending a set piece now similarly we have to make sure that we don't develop a mentality that thinks that well we've got a corner but we ain't going to score now that can feed through from crowd, it can feed through media outlets, it can feed through other mediums such as the, the modern world. So what we do with the players, I mean we've got quite a positive environment anyways to make sure again, and it goes back to that, how thorough we are, because if we are doing all we can, and the players think they're doing all they can out in the paint, training pitch, what you're doing is you're thinking, well eventually you're going to get your rewards, um, and you've got to work on that basis. Outside that, not an awful lot more you can do. I mean, I'd love to say you can do much more, but that is probably the best way. Yeah, it's to, definitely not through the lack of effort. Oh, it's frustrating. Yeah. How much analytical data do we use as a club? So there's a lot of interest in XG, mm. expected goals, touches and box, all that sort of stuff. Do you take an interest in that? We take an interest in some of the stats we will provide. Um, Sometimes if prompted, so if I'm prompting the, the analysis staff for it, sometimes they'll give it to me voluntarily if they feel as if it's appropriate. Um, um, I, I think that I would never discount um, any of the information that's made available nowadays. Um, now, a, a lot of it is made available for not just performance reasons, sometimes for gambling reasons, whatever it is, you mm -hmm. know, what people look at. And there's a plethora of information out there and, but the reality is, is football is still retains a, a high degree of unpredictability um, so you have to be careful with it as well but there's a, undoubtedly there's benefit of it um, so again for example we've looked recently at when we cross the ball how many bodies do we have in the box so that's a good one for us because then it allows us then to if we're showing visuals to the players we're asking them to improve upon a certain aspect of the game and then we can back it up with the stats um, then it's good and we've used it a bit this season with um, you know, performance trackers in terms of where we are in the league and, and where we need to get to and what we need to do in different aspects of whether that's goals for or against points etc so there's definitely a place for it um, you know it's like everything I suppose is how you use them I know it's a very common thing to say but that's probably the reality of it as well Everyone knows about our current run of not scoring more than one goal per game I, don't, I think it's probably about 10 games now we've been on that run is there something we can do different tactically? Is that the sort of thing that you think about whether or not this four two three one we've got going at the minute is working, or if you need to change the way you play at home? Is that the kind of conversations that you have, or you do you ignore that sort of stat? Um, no, we don't. We we don't ignore anything in terms of um, taking it into account. Probably when we reflect upon a game, 
yes, the performance did we get what we wanted from it. Um, and that's why a lot of the time I've got the benefit, or we've got the benefit of watching games back. So not that many supporters will watch a game again. Mm -hmm. I don't mean that as a criticism, it's just the reality. And also I watch it back, or we spend time watching it back on a wide angle. And sometimes your perception of is different. And however, we have spent a little bit of time recently looking at so there's two again there's two sides to that. We've that run, but we've also the only team in England to score in every league game. Yeah. So I suppose it depends if you're glass half full <laughs> or glass half empty. But again, it's an area that we can get better at because undoubtedly if you score two, then it gives you an even higher chance of winning the game. Um and so there's particularly this week we've looked at we've spent a lot of time this week um looking at some things. I'm not going to get too much detail because I don't want to give away secrets yeah. as well, but um and it was great, we had a really good meeting with the players this morning, we had some really good footage clipped and it was allowed us to um to highlight clearly some of the things that we can do better. And by I mean better, I mean not just the players on the pitch, but me and what the staff can do better in terms of the instruction we're giving them. And we did a really good training session today related to that and we'll do another one on Thursday. And so again it's us being you know, we're not so when I'm saying I've scored in every league game, which I think is a great record. But rather than us going defensive with it and saying, how well, can, can you be critical of scoring every league game? Well, yeah, we have done it. I think players should be proud of that. And as a club, we should be proud of it. But, right, how do we make sure we score more in league games? I would rather look at it that way, and that's what we do. You know, we're quite willing to be self critical and say, right, how do we make sure we keep getting better? Yeah, I think that can come back to, especially the way opposition teams will set up against <coughs> us. I think, obviously, if we, if we go ahead in the game, we don't flip and then become defensive. Obviously, that game becomes a little bit cagey at that point when it is 1-0. Uh, but, yeah, ideally, we want to go and score two, three, four goals a season, like we probably did at the start of the season. Mm -hmm. But I think that maybe comes back to a little bit of respect from opposition teams and how they set up against us as well. And another thing, obviously, personnel within the building. You know, we've added to that this window, and it definitely gives us different options in, in the forward, forward areas as well. Will we need to change the way we play to accommodate Will Grigg? Will you change the, the style of football? Obviously he's a different player to Josh Madger, he's a different player to Charlie Wyke. Um, no, I mean I think we'll, we'll, we'll make tweaks within um, sometimes how we set up and how we do things. Um, not just not just to accommodate Will, I think just in general to make sure we, we keep making ourselves, give ourselves the best chance of winning games. Um, we, you know, with the exception of the games that Charlie's played, we've never really had a physical outlet in forward areas and you know, Will's greatest strength isn't that either. You know, he's, he's, he gives us a decent presence, but that's not what his game's built on. Um, but again, what we're looking at at the moment is how do we just give Will maximum opportunities? How do we give any of our forward going players the most opportunities to score goals? So I would say that's probably more of a, a driver for us at the moment than, than how do we accommodate one player? Because I think that would be disrespectful to the other players that we have in the group as well. Um, but certainly, He'll give us something that arguably we've not had this season as well. Is like an out and out poacher type striker, you know, because um, Charlie's a different type. Josh was a very different type. Um, you know, I know I had this argument about him not being an out and out striker, and people that meant people thought I meant he wasn't a forward. He was, but Josh's strengths were different to him. Yeah. You know, that he was his ability to take possession of the ball in tight areas and outside the box was probably what he enjoyed and sometimes we had to encourage him not to come at the ball all the time because it shortened the game for us so um, but yeah but I mean that and then once Will's in and playing with us as well we, you'll not, he'll not, he needs to get a feel for other yeah. players they need to try and build up the relationship the challenge when you come at the end of January is obviously he needs to do that um, pretty quickly Last 10 minutes uh, there's a few final questions but this one's not even about Sunderland what did you make of Spygate at Leeds? What did you make of that? Uh, I know there was a big fuss made about it at the time and I know that the manager kind of said that he had done so many hours uh, of analysis on, on the opposition so my take on it would be then why did he have to spy on them if he knew everything about them he was obviously gaining that extra little bit of knowledge whether it was a team which if you know the team a day or two before can have an influence on, on who you select uh, so I say it's not I not ideal for from my point of view, but it's I suppose it happens all over as well. So it's it's just something you need to get on with, I suppose. Are you gonna look to get bigger walls? Yeah, for, <laughs> for playing yeah, next um, It's interesting how the games evolved that way, though, because um, you know I suppose there's there was a, not so long ago where people would have had easy access to watch teams train. Um, 
again, the, the advances in technology, etc. But I can understand why that's not the case now because if somebody had open access to watch your train, how they then recorded what you were doing and how they got that information to other people was wasn't that easy to do. But it's now we live in an era whereby you can watch a team train and have the information and the footage available to all and sundry very quickly. So there is a, and it's it, sometimes it's a shame because that would. I don't have any issues people we watching us train in terms of what we do and how conscious you are in the training pitch but it's that balance between the information that's then made available to, to your competitors or your opponents um, I suppose for me and it was maybe a cultural thing I, I thought it was inappropriate in terms of from a respect side of the game Look, we're, all, we're all seeking to gain advantages and beat the opponents we come up against but there should always be a healthy respect in terms of you know you're doing you're all doing the same job, and it's a difficult job as well. Um, so it was a, I suppose it, it maybe there was maybe more made of it than maybe people in the game would have, um, and I could understand then why there was so much interest around the stuff that was produced post after it. But again, I don't think Frank touched on that. There was a lot. Of, there's a lot of clubs produce a lot of the same type of information and spend as long looking at opposition. What's who's been the most interesting or surprising team have come against this season? A team that played maybe in a different way to what you expected? Because the one that stuck in my head was Wickham. They came here and they played a brilliant game. Um, but is there any other teams that have surprised you in their approach? I think that it sort of changes weekly. I think we found that, especially for us coming down uh, early in the season. Uh, the teams that I suppose facing us, it was a different challenge for them. So they would. Initially, I think teams dropped off and they were quite compact. Then teams started to come and press us quite high because we were looking to try and build from the back. And then I think recently they've probably dropped off mm. uh, and been a bit more compact again as well. So I think on a weekly basis, it's a challenge for us, not necessarily knowing how teams are going to set up. Uh, and, and then it's how we react to that within uh, within the game. Yeah, I think that's probably more than being any specific team. I think that variance in how teams have approached the games, particularly the Stadium of Light, so if you go back to Oxford even earlier in the season, you know Oxford that day came in and pressed really high up the pitch, which was probably not what we expected, oh, and they did it well. Yeah. And 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 yet, then if you look at the last couple of home games, whereby teams have gave up a lot of territory against us, so that that's been an interesting dynamic for us to deal with as well. And hence the reason why we're always looking at how we're setting up. What do we do? Um, that's a big one for us at the moment. We'll, we'll focus on do we have enough players ahead of the ball when we're in possession, and we're doing quite a lot in that over the last week. Um, so that's been that's that's probably been the biggest dynamic, and that's not it's not easy because normally you get a reasonably consistent approach, and most teams you can predict how they'll come and they'll play against. It's not really so much the system; it's more just sometimes their actual approach to the game that that's yeah. sometimes been unexpected, if you like. Do you think we're better suited to playing against? better teams. I don't mean that in a disrespectful way, but when Barnsley came here and Peterborough came here, we seem to play our best football in them games. I think the players have in, I think the players have enjoyed those games because there's been a challenge kind of thrown down at them by me to say that, you know, those are those games at the time were, were big games and, you know, the challenge for them is that big games require big players. And we've got some of them in our squad and I think they've all risen to that challenge at that time. Because I think they've looked at it as an opportunity to say, and it's not I'm saying their approach hasn't been the same for other games, but certainly also in those games, the game has become. <coughs> I think we're better when the game becomes spread, um, and in those games they were very open from the beginning because Peter Bar and Barnsley came and thought, well, we can win here, rightly or wrongly, nothing wrong with that. They came, but the game has all of a sudden went big, and we've got game breakers or match winners, if you like, within our squad that that suits. Um, so. You're right, I mean, those games you've pointed to, I think they have been amongst our, our best performances this season. And we've got a few of them to come, you know, home and away. And I would hope that the players would respond to those types of games as they have done. And finally, looking ahead, we've got a big period where we've got a lot of home games coming up. How important is it for you to make sure that we come through that in the top three? Because, I mean, this is the make or break time of the season, really. You know, decide if we're going to be an automatic promotion or a playoff team. Yeah, I mean, we... Um, I think that, that for us the the season has been a it's been a really interesting one for everybody. I think that we um again not labouring on it because all you can affect is what lies ahead. The summer was probably way more challenging than I think maybe some people appreciate. And I do think we've came an awful long way in a short period of time. 
but we've got an awful long way to go to get to where we want to get to, and that includes this period we've got ahead of us. And I'm conscious of that. This job, all along, it's a privilege to be manager here and privilege to work at the club because it's a brilliant football club, but big demands. But you can't have one without the other. Um, and so we've always been open about our ambitions and we've been we've been prepared to put ourselves under that pressure. And today, I keep saying to the players all the time that you know don't beat themselves down. They've, what they've done so far has been good. The points per game is good. They keep doing that. They give themselves a really, really good chance of promotion. And that, and again, people say, oh, well, we should be. Should it? This club has went through an awful lot in the last couple of years and we've had an awful lot of transition and turmoil in a period that gets very quickly forgotten about. Um, and what they've done is give themselves a platform for success. In this period of what coming up, yeah, you're absolutely right. It's a really important period for us. The great thing is we feel as if we've put ourselves in a position squad-wise that we're at the healthiest and maybe strongest we've been all season. So it's up to us to get the most out of them now and, and for those players to respond to the to the opportunity to go and have, to achieve something. You know, irrespective of what level you get to in the game, James and I had long playing careers. You know, James won a League Cup in Scotland with Kilmarnock. I got beat in a final. You don't get that many, don't, unless you're the very lucky ones, you don't get many chances. So we, we've got a squad now that could potentially win a cup and get promoted. It's not bad. you know. So that that we have to constantly remind them of that. Because it's tough here sometimes, you've got to constantly remind them that what they've done so far has been good. Not absolutely outstanding, but still very good. And it's given them every opportunity, if they want to grasp it, uh, having a really good season. Yeah, and I think it's going to be a joint effort as well. Obviously, players, staff <coughs> and fans will be obviously maybe getting a bit nervy as well, but it's important that obviously they, they give us the backing that they have throughout the season and hopefully then we can give them things to shout about and be positive as well on the stand because 1-0 games they are nervy. Uh, it was nervy the weekend. Yeah, so <laughs> and, and it's important and, it, and it's hard because obviously fans want success as well, but let's try to flip that into a positive for us and inspire the players when they think maybe they just need a little lift because it, it does work both ways fans need to give sorry players need to give fans something to shout about but sometimes when you think you're maybe on the back foot or you're camping a little bit just that little roar uh, that we've heard throughout the season as well can, can be a massive lift for the players okay, thanks for coming on I appreciate cheers, it cheers Connor cheers thank you Trainless, eh? a lot better than Stuart's <laughs> <laughs> you can leave that bit in <laughs> cheers guys thank you <laughs>